G'day, welcome to Mark and Sam After Work. Well, today is New Year's Eve, um, and today I had planned to go and take the 270 Winchester out to 2,000 metres or a bit beyond um, and do a three shot or a five shot shoot with that to see how well I could make it perform. Um, this footage here shows you that it was a peculiar day. It was all the things we wanted in one fashion. It wasn't too hot. It's been over 40 degrees, so 43 degrees yesterday, so 104 degrees Fahrenheit type thing um, and blistering hot. Today was supposed to be calmer, a little bit cooler, but what we didn't know was there was a fog cloud, whatever it was, very, very hazy, couldn't see anything. Um, and so we had to come up with a different video to be able to put today because that wasn't going to work. We couldn't see. So um, what I decided to do is something I very rarely touch on. Um, I've sort of had a couple of videos about it, but to go through reloading or hand loading um, in a very generalized form, but to answer some specific questions I get and give, I suppose, my um, uh, process, my thoughts on hand loading and what you need to do for what we do. And for what, I, what for precision shooting, but this is ELR precision shooting, and I suppose it has some caveats to it um, in differences to a particular one load sort of shooting. So whether you're F class or PRS or whatever it is, and the guys, and you're just setting up one lot of shooting, um, or sorry, one sort lot of ammo, and always looking for that extra little bit, whether you find it or not, but always looking for it versus us that are using a lot of different calibers and I suppose that means I come back to what works and nothing more. A bit my way of doing things in general if I can really get real performance gains or if, I, if I'm trying to fix a problem that I have then that's totally the path I go down but if I don't have problems I don't do any more than I need to is the simple truth of it. If it works well, if it ain't broke don't fix it. So I suppose we'll start with the basics. Um, in the way of a reloading um, press, what we use, we use the Rock Crusher uh, in there in the image there. So it's a simple single stage press is what I've always used for all my reloading, um, except for the Barrett stuff where I use a Hornady press. But does the job, does the job really well, nice and simple. I'm not after multi-stage heads or things like that. I'm not trying to do thousands of rounds at any one time. So where I'll do generally 50 or 100, then it's really straightforward and I really like to be involved and feel everything. I like the solid, the, the rigidity of the system um, and yet I still have good fingertip control. So all works nicely and I'm very happy with that press. Um, reloading dies um, and what we do and I suppose this is the first stage where we go into where I go with what works as I said. Now in the early days I went through the process of three or four or five different dies I would try things and learning things and figuring stuff out and that's including when you had the competition dies where you have the neck collets and understanding them properly um, and I suppose that's one of the things that a lot of people uh, may get a little bit crooked, a little bit wrong. Um, and that is when you have a, neck, a competition neck sizing die that has both the expandable and then runs specific neck sizing dies, uh, the, the collets inside there, replaceable sleeves, that system isn't really designed to work together. The expandable, although you can get a little bit of the crush on the outside and the expandable on the inside, when you pull that expandable back out is where the size that you really sort of end up with. So if you're using the competition collets or where you have the next size of collet and you change it, it's really designed to use with no expandable, at least for the last process. No expandable, so it sizes it exactly to that. I do very little of that sort of sizing. I Whether it's full length sizing or neck, or just neck sizing, um, I really probably more tend to go towards full length, but I go with what suits my brass, what my brass needs. Uh, the likes of the 223 it, with the pull brass, little Seiko 85, it needs to be fully expanded to get all its powder in. If you do a full length size, it can't, it starts to compress the load a little bit too much. Um, and then there's other quirks. I'm not going to go into all the quirks of different loads, but largely if I can go with full length sizing, then I would tend to fall back to that nowadays. But there's really not much difference in performance side of things. Um, there is, there's benefits for neck sizing only as well, less work in your brass and all that sort of stuff. But what I, the next bit I'd go into is I have gone from, you know, this, this here is just a set of competition dies, a very simple set of competition dies for the 243. Um, the nice, simple, that's a, a full length sizer. It has a, a little bit of a different way of operating for putting the bullet in, 
but it's really a very simple set that's all worked really always worked really well and I've never gone past that point um, and then I've gone to where I went through three different sets of dies with the 6.5 Creedmoor to end up with this here, this competition reading set that worked really, really well. Really like it, really worked how, liked how it worked. And what I'm largely talking about there is a little bit how the brass feeds through it and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately it's also really, I tend to run the expandable, so I'm going to the expandable. And then it's a little bit of a match between the brass and that die to the end up where I get the right seating um, pressure. So as I push the bullet in with the seating die, there's a very nice, smooth, gentle feel as it goes in there. So that combination works for me. And then any other little quick, you know, what, it, what the brass is actually, how much it's moving, what it's actually shaping like, um, little details of simply looking at things. And I suppose that works when we're talking about neck sizing or full length sizing, we're talking about the lube that, we tend, that we're using on there. Very important to lube your brass and make sure that it's doing the right thing on that score. Um, I use largely the Hornady One Shot is what I use. It sprays on nicely. It's nice and simple to do. I spray it on so I make sure I get a little tiny bit in the neck as well as on the neck and down the side of it. So I'll, I'll tend to take the, the load of brass and spray one side, turn it around, spray the other side, and that tends to be it. I don't want it dripping, but I want it so it's all got a little bit on it. That tends to work. For anything that's not a real fight, that works beautifully. When I step up and it gets into where I've got to work a bit harder, this stuff's going to stick. And it's a very important thing to be careful with that. For people who are new at resizing brass, um, if you go and push too hard, and when you're actually pulling down your lever and you push a little bit too hard where it doesn't really sort of follow through, you can get to where it jams. In that case, unless you're really crafty sometimes, you can have wrecked your die and it can be a real mess you're getting yourself out of. So making sure that comes on fairly smoothly and doesn't get to that sticking point is important. Um, and for the heavier stuff, I use the um, RCBS, the little pad, as you can see, been used quite a bit, and I use their lube. I tip it on here, rub it around, then roll the brass around in it, put a little bit in the neck type thing, but that works really well. And I use this stuff for even when I'm really pushing the 50 BMG stuff in a different press, that sort of stuff, this is the stuff I use and it is really, really good, works really well. Now listen, I know there's lots of people with suggestions and they use this, that and the other, and awesome, not up to suggestions actually, just let point out what I use, what you need to make sure is that your lube's up to it and you don't get to that point where you've pulled it halfway down and then it's stuck and you're trying to pull it back off and it rips the rim off the case and it gets all messy, making sure you got that covered. Those are the two I use. Okay, so um, so just touching back to them, and then I find in the in the bullet seating dies, very probably almost more important in in truth. Um, and I'm probably taking a st uh, jumping a step forward, but I do for, carry on with that for the moment. Having something that has the ability where it actually captures the bullet and holds it straight for a little while. Um, this is the Forster. Um, uh, straight line die set, um, bullet seating die. Um, I use them in my 300 wind mag, my 3.3 Lapur, or my 7mm rem mag. Really good system, really like them, work really well. Nice lock up system, all that sort of stuff, really nice. Um, I think this is a Wilden one that I got for the, um, the 6.5 Gap. Um, that's very good. Um, actual fact, the new Hornady stuff, and I wasn't really a fan of the Hornady dies previously, but their new ones, they've really been putting a lot of effort into these. They're very nice systems. That's just using gravity to do the same job. But they're, yeah, they're nice systems. I, my, I suppose my end result is, um, or what I'm really saying is, if the bare basics, and I've got some of the bare basics as an image I'll put in there of the, all of the different dies I use, um, if the really, really simple Lee die or whatever it is, if it works well, leave it alone. I'm, I'm fine with it. I get what, especially with lots of calibers, I get what I can. I don't want to spend $500 on a set if I can avoid it, but I, I start with the basics. If that's no good, then I'll upgrade the pieces I need. Um, if, I, if there is a good deal where I can buy a, 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 a um, premium set, a competition set, something like that, um, and it's there and it's not that much more, then I'll spend that little bit more to start off with. But really, I go through the don't fix what ain't broken. If I've got a simple set, it works well. That's where I leave it. And then I work from there. Okay, so like I said, that's the dies. In the normal process that I would do with reloading my brass is to, to a large degree nowadays, I am annealing. I'm testing this machine. This is the annealing made perfect machine. So I'm sort of testing it, seeing what my overall results are. Um, 
And I suppose in 50% of cases, I'm finding I'm not seeing a lot of difference. With some of brass, it's not seeing a lot of difference. It's quite nice. I like the process that I'm annealing. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more life out of it in places. In other places, I just haven't shot it enough to honestly tell. But in 50% in of my brass, I'm seeing real uh, more consistency, both in how it's actually shooting, but also how it feels. And I suppose that sort of come back to a big part of my loading process um, would be that when I, at the, the end of the day, the whole, everything short, I want it to feel smooth. I want it to feel like it's happy with the equation we're going through, whether that's full length sizing it or neck sizing it, or that's, or that's trimming it, or that's um, reloading the bullets or whatever it is. I want it to feel like it's happening in a process that feels right. I'm not fighting with the brass. Um, and the annealer definitely helps in that equation, it definitely helps in that process. I suppose it is also another little um, thing that is um, uh, probably silly inane to talk about, but the process of doing the annealing, if you have got that option, gives you that more comfort zone of you're doing the job more thoroughly. Um, and I suppose I would now say I do the annealing where I do very, very little brass tumbling. Now, I used to do, used to, I, I started off using the, the, um, peanut shells or whatever it was sort of stuff and rolling like that. I really didn't like the cleaning process of going through that and it wasn't, it, 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 it was a bit painful in my mind and I wasn't seeing enough gain out of it. I then did a fair bit of cleaning things up where I'd spray CRC on things and rub them with, with a little bit of worn out um, Brillo pad type thing and get them all clean like that and wash them down, that, that sort of stuff. A bit painful, didn't really need to. Found largely I didn't need to do much but I did start, I had, be, had to be careful, look after my glass, brass and that side of things. Then I spent a couple of years of using the stainless steel medium, wet stainless steel medium tum tumbling. Come up with beautiful shiny brass, um, but that's about the only feature I would say I got out of it. I had to go through the whole drying process, quite a bit of stuff to go through there. Um, I felt I might have odor polished a little bit, but really all it was about was the shininess. Now if the shininess matters and really clean looking brass matters, then I get it. If it's actually time is money or you, you, you're uh, like once again fix problems don't fix things that aren't problems then keep my brass legs and clean don't lay them around the dirt that sort of stuff I pull it out put it back in the box come in reload it I can do that five six ten times and the brass doesn't ha suffer any problems because it's got a little bit of color on it but what I did find was by uh, with annealing I get the process of where I just make sure my brass is largely clean I anneal it and then I decap it and then I go through the finishing side of it whether there's something wrong to that and someone wants to tell me that's wrong, I found that worked quite well. It meant it helped a little bit with the cleaning. It would just, but as long as I'd made sure there was no garbage on them, it would clean off nicely on that sort of score. I was getting to nail the process. Um, I'm not looking for color with this machine because it analyzes. And, the, and for people who don't know, the nearly made pro, um, perfect um, machine is very quiet, fast, very simple to use, but probably its biggest advantage is not how well it anneals because it does that very well but that's not its advantage the advantage is you can analyze your brass so you're not looking at color you're not looking at the redness you're not looking at anything you're getting it to analyze it and so it is looking at the details and then you go through and do your batch like that so once you've written your number it we just put it back through it makes it a really simple process so on that it's a real win for me um, work really nicely and yes I'm using it I'm using it a lot and that's part of the process but that's what I do I, I, I basically make sure it's clean there's no bugs and, and gunk in it I then anneal it and then I decap it whether that's full length or actually we'll, we'll resize it full length or um, or neck sizing uh, whichever process that's what I go through and do okay so we've got annealed resized brass and its basics the next thing I do depends on the brass. For a while there, I would um, trim um, in any form with, with either one of these. I quite like my old um, Lehman system here using these, um, uh, the world's best trimmers or yeah, world's finest trimmers. Use them a little bit. I really came to where I probably prefer using the full length trim size rather than, rather than trimming from the shoulder, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and I do that as to, I don't do it all the time anymore. Um, a little bit time is money, but a little bit, I wasn't really seeing any real gains out of taking off um, two thousand or three thousand, that sort of stuff. If I've got proper growth, 
and I measure to see if I've got proper growth. If I've got decent growth, then I need to keep it in check, then I come back down. But otherwise, I probably would only trim every three or four times. I'd go through and trim and do the deburring all the rest of it. Um, like I said, I, I tend to, whether there's a good logic or a bad logic, I tend to prefer to trim over the full length of the case rather than the shoulder on the case. Should end up with very similar, but that's what I do. Um, the next pieces. And I suppose I'm, I'm going, no, I'll come back to these things. The, 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 the next thing I tend to do, if I have trimmed, then I use the RCBS um, multi-stage thing and I go through and I just deburr the outside of it. I always use the VLD. This is the Sinclair VLD um, deburrer or it's a chamfer. I use it in actually a little cordless drill. It is made to come in this little handle, but that's what I do there. Um, once I've done those things, if I have had the deburr, I tend to like to run the expander ball back through again. This isn't an essential thing, but I tend to prefer to run the expander ball back through again, so I take any little burrs off the inside of it. Um, as for cleaning out the primer pocket, yes I do. Um, I'll go through and run the little brush on it. In some of the newer brass, I'll go through and run the unifying little little grinder in there, little cutter in there to actually take out and smooth out the bottom of it. Um, and I found either way really works. Uh, beyond that point, um, I suppose in the, in the carrying on with that process, we've got a piece of, piece of brass that's done and I'll come back to, there's a couple of things in here which I'll come back to preparing brass to start off with. But once I go through that process there, then I'm really in the world of um, making sure my brass is then wiped down and clean. It should all come up nice and wipe the, wipe the lube off it. Just use a soft white rag, wipe the lube off it. I've cleaned out either end, all that's nice and clean. Then I'll recap. I use those little tools there, the little RCBS once again, um, in the way of a little priming tool. I'll tend to use the um, Federal Gold Medal, um, be them the small or the large rifle, but I'll go through and that's what I, I, I reprime all the brass with that sort of stuff. At the moment, when it comes to powder and filling, I, and have been for the last 10 years, been using the Charge Master 1500. Um, I've done the program changes and bits and pieces, which you'll see on YouTube to go through and do that sort of stuff. I've done all that sort of stuff and made all that so that that works as well as it can. And I've found, I suppose I've said this many times, I will tend to do, um, I don't tend to use chronographs. I have over the last couple of years, but I don't tend to go look for extreme spreads or for SDs or any of that sort of stuff. I'll go through and see how it groups. I'm shooting at long range, so I have to have things pretty good at doing that side of things. You can see in my elevation changes um, is one of the things I'm looking for, which isn't just your velocity, as a lot of people would think it is. There's other things going on. Um, and most of my focus is on making it load consistency and then shoot it properly, set up the rifle properly, and then get my groups. And you've all seen how my groups are. Largely, they're, they're largely like you see. There's sometimes we take a little bit longer to get onto target, and there's sometimes when you have other days with wind, and it's generally wind I'm dealing with. But you'll see largely what they look like when I've got something sorted out. Now, in running a chronograph, running the lab radar, I've got to see that, okay, I do get down to where there's sometime getting down to single digit extreme spreads. Uh, most times a little bit above that in the in the 20s type thing, I suppose, overshoot is what you generally see. You know, the, the 15 to 25 sort of stuff would be extreme spread sort of stuff. Um, I tend to be dealing with windy conditions and dealing with the machine as well, so it gets a little confusing to actually do it properly. But that's largely what I see. And in some cases, r ridiculously small extreme spreads out of my loading processes. Um, but that, what we are going to do is we get one of the V3 trickler systems, the um, auto loader, basically a very good, very more accurate down to another tenth in the way of powder um, distribution. Um, and we'll see if that makes any differences. My thoughts on it are largely that I run a percentage based thing. So if you're, sh if you're largely loading 23 grains or 25 grains or 30 grains or 40 grains, then 0.1 of a grain is, and trying to get extreme accuracy, I can see how you could go a little bit, you go down to 0.01 of a grain and see more accuracy because as much as a small percentage, it's a reasonable percentage. When you're loading 90 and or 80 and 90 and 100, 120 and 200 and things like that, 
then all of a sudden 0 0.01% 0.01 of a grain is getting to the point where I don't believe you're going to see any differences once your once your numbers are up high enough the percentage of the sorry yeah the percentage of 0 0.01 grains is negligible with more powder and maybe that's why I haven't needed to go that way but we're going to try one of the other ones and see um, and then I, I suppose beyond that point, then the, I, it's really back to using the full length sizing die and how smoothly it goes in. It's as simple as that. Um, as for setting up your seating, the, uh, your, yeah, your seating depths or your bullet jump or all those bits and pieces are all videos I've sort of discussed previously. I don't fuss too much on it. There's pressure I'm looking at um, and I don't tend to do the ladder testing, but there's sound logic to all that sort of stuff. And I suppose now's the time I'll go through and explain uh, what I probably should have earlier, the, the other things that I would do and questions that I get. Um, and that would be more about brass preparation to start off with. First one, I suppose, would be do I neck turn? Um, this is the little okay, I'm shooting. Um, there's a few of these. I think there's 20, uh, Century 21, that sort of stuff, but a neck turning system. You'll see videos on how to use them. Um, largely what I hear about them being used is for concentricity. So making sure you put, you get a concentricity gauge, set up your bullet and spin it over and make sure it's all dead straight. And there's a good sound logic to that. It means that it's going to feed better in the rifling as long as your rifling's dead straight. It's, it's going to feed better in your rifling, all that sort of stuff. That's not the reason why I neck turn. There's two reasons I neck turn. Um, one is the brass is uneven. When I measure it with a micrometer and I go through and measure the neck, I'll get 14th hour on one side and 16th hour on the other side and 17th hour over here and 13th hour over there. I go around and I'll measure it in four or five spots. And if it's not even, and I'll check a few of them, it's not even, then there is a logic to making that even. I use the pool brass mainly. I use a bit of Norma, I use a bit of Peterson, I've used a bit of, um, well, depends on what I've got to use sometimes. There's other brasses I've got to use um, with Hornady or Remington or whatever it is, depending on the calibre I'm shooting. Um, and once again, if it all loads well and it shoots well, I don't tend to fuss. Uh, but when I start to check things and I'm looking for that a little bit more, then I measure for evenness. I also measure for how thick that is. I don't want 20 thou. I'm, I'm largely aiming for around the 14 to 16 thou when I'm actually measuring with the thickness of that brass. I know that there's some F class, or no F class, some competition shooters that will go down to 8 thou and 9 thou, ridiculously thin brass to try and get that less tension and, and more evenness and all the rest of it. I, but that is why I neck turn. So the main reason I neck turn is that I'm wildcatting and I've shrunk my neck down so it's smaller, so, so it becomes thicker, and then I've got to neck turn it out. That's as simple as that. Some of the other brasses where they are made, the brass has been made, it's been heavier. Some of the 50 BMG stuff started off at the 25 foul, very, very thick brass. So I pulled that back down and, and shaped it all back out. But that's why I neck turn when I neck turn. Largely, I don't need to neck turn at all, but that's, that's the reason I do it. Not to say there's not decent logic to going with concentricity and making it dead straight, but I don't even have that gauge. Um, my ride, I haven't had to fix that problem. Um, the um, the VLD, I mentioned that, the VLD, yes, I think that's a really valuable thing. Having a really nice chamfer on the inside of the brass makes it smooth, load smoother, a really nice feature to go with it. With all bullets, especially with monolithic bullets because of the machine edge on it, the machine surface on it makes it a lot better. But that's definitely a, a go, definitely something I do to all the brass right at the beginning. I tend to measure and check, but I'll tend to trim brass if it's uneven. Um, generally on the, on after the first firing. So it's all pushed itself out and all made itself even. If it's ratty to start off with, then I'll do it straight away. But once again, using better brass doesn't tend to be an issue. The flash hole unifier or flash hole chamfer. Um, this is basically you've got your, your bottom of your, of your brass with the, where the primer goes in. There's a hole that goes into the brass on the inside there. Now that's, that brass, that hole has been stamped out with a little pin, a little mandrel. Um, and sometimes there'll be a little bit of clearance and a little bit of sharp edge on the inside there. Whether it's a square edge, a sharp edge, a regular edge, all the rest of it. Um, the simple process says to, I don't put a magnifying glass in there and see what's going on. I've got this set up, I put it in there. I use this on a little drill as well, but you can do it with your hand as well. But I then see what comes out. 
if if I get nothing out when I turn a few of these and I'll go through half a dozen on a set of 50 half a dozen if nothing comes out which is rare but that does happen then I don't do it if I get a reasonable amount out then I know that little chamfer this tiny chamfer I think I'm it to me it's something I've always done they always shoot really well so it's something that I always do um, the last lot of uh, the pool brass I got um, Nothing came out. It was just, it was all very neat and tidy. It was very nice brass. Um, that was 300 Norma brass. It was very nice brass. It worked, re performed really well, uh, but I didn't have to do anything. But quite regularly, another little pearl brass as well, I'll go through and I'll end up with a nice little pile of brass out of going through and doing the unifying. It's something I always test. It just makes sure exactly that, that I'm unifying. And that's all I really am trying to do. Another thing I know people are going to ask is bullet sorting or ammunition sorting. So bullet sorting and brass sorting. So that's comparing weights on brass and bullets, that's comparing um, your overall length or your bearing surface um, diameter um, or your um, ogive length, all that sort of stuff with bullets. And then your weight um, is largely what you're comparing um, with your brass side of things. Um, I suppose overall length a little bit. Um, in places I have measured all of them um, and there is sound logic to measuring all of them in looking for the nth. Um, what I've tended to find is that in some places where I've needed to, like, I've, like I keep on saying, where, where I've been dealing with an issue, then yes, I have gone through and done, and done some sorting on that sort of level. Um, when I have been doing comparisons between things and working out why one is shooting better than the other, then I'll actually go through and do that. See one brand of bullets versus another brand of bullets. Uh, one lot of brass versus another lot of brass. But largely, I find that when I get to the place where I want to be, where I get to a round that, or get to a bullet or brass that works properly for me, I don't need to do it. Apart from the obvious of looking at it um, and making sure there's no dings in it, there's no deformations in it, um, then that's largely, where it, that's largely where it stays. And so what I'm saying overall is largely, no, I don't do any bullet sorting or any brass sorting. I just use good quality stuff. And that is largely 99% of the time that works for what I do. And I, I suppose I think that's, that's about the main list of ingredients in the simple stuff. I come back to where I started. Um, if it works with the simple stuff, I don't go any further. Um, and that's from a simple set of dies to whatever lube you're using and whether that's next sizing or resizing, but your whole process, and that's without or with annealing, whatever, your whole process works really well, I'll leave it, leave it alone. I think a lot of people are, well, I suppose there's, there's, there's a few things going on to make sense of why people look for more. To start off with, the thing's not shooting well enough, it's all over the place. Um, my call would be if you basically got a pretty good stable at the same amount of powder then the preloads feels that the, the neck tension is all pretty even um, everything's sort of working pretty nicely and you've got it all over the place uh, my first thing would be to rather than looking at tuners or looking at seating depths or all the things you'd look um, in the loading side of things I would look at the shooter and the rifle is the first place I would look I'm not saying that's the case but that's that's how I would do it um, Obviously, you go on the internet, you go on places, and there's people that are doing all these things, and they're bullet pointing, not something I do. Uh, my quick summation on that is in a larger bullet, if you can largely see. If they look irregular on the end, you're probably going to deal with them. Um, in the way of making them more efficient, better, better um, BC, that sort of stuff, it's really going to be more about smaller bullets where you can make a real change. Once again, it's that percentage thing, a little sharp point on a really small bullet makes it more efficient. A little sharp point on a bullet that's already, it's already big and already got a fairly good point on it, you're not going to make a lot of change. Uh, but largely, you can see by, the, by looking at it, compare them all. You know, whether you're using a micrometer, largely your eye will tell you what they look like. If they're irregular and uneven, that sort of stuff, then trimming and pointing can probably give you little gains. I haven't gone there, haven't needed to, same process. And I suppose keep in mind with a lot of these things, the concentrated ga gauge, the bullet pointing, um, the exact seating depths, the, 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 there's all sorts of things, a range of things. I'm not going to try and bring them all up in my head right now. But a lot of the times when you're looking at a competition shooter that is shooting 10,000 of those rounds this year, um, be whatever form of competition there is, and they're looking for that little bit. There's two things to keep in mind in the competition. Yeah, I suppose it's mainly two things. One is they're looking for everything and they've got a whole heap of time to work with this brass 
and to work with these loads and you make one sensible change to it that's a small part of the process and you potentially are going to get gains what everyone does in competition is i don't know if it gives the game but i don't want to risk not doing it so i'll do it anyway it's part of trying to win part of the process of trying to win you do extra to try to win so that means that potentially not to say anything they're saying is a bad thing to do at all but keep in mind that it, it may be a that next level and and to some degree or another that's more of what their thing is it's more about doing the loading they spend more time doing than that than and put more effort into that than the little time they spent shooting so this is where they get to put their effort in so get it you understand it but don't don't feel you need to do it unless you have that problem so a little complicated but I'm just trying to um, there's some people that focus a little hard on a detail they really feel they should be doing and not necessarily going to see gains unless they've got all the other ducks in line and even then and I suppose the other thing that I suppose well there's a little bit of focus on nowadays I suppose it's always been that way and that's the best group how'd you get that best group where'd that best group come from um, I think I've said this before um, but be that the um, be that a world championship or be that the local backyard or be that a video or be that it is the best group is not necessarily from the best shooter and it's not necessarily from the best load the best group more more commonly and historically has been the that's what it was there was the best group and the other groups weren't so good the best shooter and the best average well those are actually two different things than the best group I've certainly seen countless times where I've seen ridiculously small groups, three shots and five shot groups that went really well in the day. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'll still show them. I'm probably not going to be jumping up and down and saying it's just an amazing gun, that sort of stuff. I'm going to be saying there's a bit of luck involved because that's what it is. Um, there's an old antage, I can't think of the proper thing, but it was to describe that the, the, the best group on the day was almost never the best shooter or the winner of the day, except for the best group price. It's actually the best average, quite commonly, was twice the size of the best group. But it was the average that was up and down. And the guy who shot the best group, he had this amazing group. Most of his other groups were really all over the place. And that's a little bit of if you flinch to the left and the bullet goes to the right, or if the wind blows to the left while you're squeezing to the right, uh, there's, and whether it's left to right, up or down, or, or just, just your stars lined up in that moment. Um, it's... I think you get where I'm going with this sort of stuff. Don't put too much on an amazing, I saw that, so they must know this. They won on race day, I saw it in the car world. This car won on race day, so it must be the best car. Well, there's all the other details that went on. And luck is a luck is a feature to go with it. Generally, in the race car world, it's everybody else's bad luck rather than that guy's good luck. But when it comes to shooting, it's a little bit the opposite. It's the lucky bit that actually works for you. That gives you that shot, that gives you that group, that side of things. So not to take anything away from amazing shooting that people have done over the years, more to the point of to focus you back to, it's really about your pile of sticks um, and you making that work. And how you do that is um, really, you've got all the time in the world and you, that's what you wanna do. You wanna do your reloading, then do the whole lot of it, try it all. You know, if you've got the funds to spend on it and you've got the time to spend on it, why not? Why not learn and why not find what suits you? There is this whole level of making this lovely box of ammunition where it's a beautiful round where everything's done and you've done everything to it. Of course, if it's really about making it shoot as well as it can, then sometimes you might be spinning your wheels. So I suppose my comment I come back to, like I've said a couple of times now, is I, I go with don't fix what ain't broken. I start with the basics and I really, I suppose, and I'd say this for brass, for bullets, for reloading equipment, wherever. I try not to overthink it, but I try not to underdo it. If I can afford to, or if I can get a good deal on a premium set of dies, then I'll do that. I always use good bullets. It's a simple thing. I always use the best brass I can buy. Whatever that is, I go through that hurdle. To a reason, within reason, I go through that hurdle. As for the rest of the equipment, these are the things I use. If you've got stuff that works for you, it works for you. The likes of annealing, you know, it's a luxury when you've got a piece of equipment so expensive, but if you're doing enough shooting, it becomes a very sensible option. Um, and I suppose that really comes back into the rest of this gear as well. Same as the, the, the more expensive reloading gear or the, um, um, 
what is it, powder, measuring gear, all that sort of stuff, a little bit the same place. If you can afford to get it, why not? But don't go overthinking it and don't expect too much from the result. Because you've got all the best gear in the world and because you're doing all the things there, if you haven't made the rifle shoot really well, well, it's not going to be the cure. Anyway, guys, that's the quick nutshell, or quick, not so much. Anyway, that was the nutshell on what we did here. That's an overview. I don't go too much into reloading because it is something that is a challenge. It is, it is um, borderline with the likes of YouTube. Uh, but also through the fact that I have a fairly simple process um, with its little idiosyncrasies simply where it asks. Um, anyway, keep in mind guys, all this sort of stuff we offer that we put forward is out of our own budget and out of the bit of support we get from supporters. So if for people who would like to be get more information or just people who'd like to help us, we have a, a various forms, but nowadays we have our 4AW club uh, really, we'd like people to do that side of things. It, it's an annual subscription um, and it turns into where we get some more funds to play this game a little bit more and be able to share a little bit more and be able to teach a little bit more for the people who want it. Anyway, guys, thanks for checking in on us and Happy New Year, everyone. And we'll, we'll catch you next year.